Hi there, this is DM Nell, and we are back with another edition of Subtle Talk. That's the Shadow of the Demon Lord role playing game uh, video log talk, um, talky thing. Uh, I still don't even know what to call this. Vlog, I guess. I don't know. Uh, video podcast, whatever. Anyway, we're back. I'm back. There's no we, it's just me. And uh, what I am going to cover today is the shadow of the demon lord and not the game but i'm talking about the actual shadow of the demon lord so what do i mean by that well the uh the whole premise of this role-playing game is that there's this being that is known as the demon lord and it is an all-powerful uh entity that lives in an extra dimensional uh, space called the void and the demon lord wants nothing but to destroy everything and so it is constantly moving from universe to universe um, and wherever it discovers a new place it the demon lord's shadow falls upon that place and that's when things start going crazy and um the uh, the shadow falling upon a world basically is the the thing that starts the world uh, to come to an end, and that uh, it really just announces the apocalypse. It is the beginning of the end, because once the uh, shadow of the demon lord has fallen, fallen upon a world, then it uh, is is very likely that that world is going to uh, eventually uh, meet its demise. And so uh, what uh, form that takes uh, can vary from world to world. And so what I would like to cover today is the form that the Demon Lord Shadow can take. And the, there are two sources that I'm going to be uh, uh, citing uh, for the Shadow. And that is the first one is in the core rulebook. And if you go to page 195, you see uh, under the running the game section, you see this uh, bold section that says Shadow of the Demon Lord. And that's where it begins talking about the various shadows and what it means in your campaign. So uh, that is the first thing I'm going to be referencing. And the second thing is the uh, source book over here. Um, that is uh, called the hunger in the void it takes the shadows that are in the core rule book and expands them um, providing more ideas and details on what those shadows could be for your campaign world uh, but for now i'm just going to start off with the core rule book and if i need to uh, jump over to the uh, the hunger in the void then i will certainly do that it's a lovely picture isn't it with a demon ripping out uh, that, that dude's eyeballs. Love the artwork in this game. Okay, so the shadow has fallen upon a world. And what form of corruption that takes uh, can be determined uh, by the rules in this book, or you can make up your own. Um, any any DM with uh, with any kind of experience has probably run some kind of end of the world scenario in their game. I know I have. And uh, basically that's what this is. It's an apocalyptic event and the heroes are there to put a stop to it if they can. If they succeed, then the world continues to exist until the next apocalyp uh, apocalyptic event occurs. Uh, if they fail, then well, game over. Uh, roll up new characters, we're uh, jumping to a new world. So that is essentially what the Shadow of the Demon Lord is. It's a list of various end of world scenarios uh, that could pot potentially happen. Now, um, any one of these that are listed here could just be a standalone event. For example, uh, the first one, Black Sun, uh, the shadow eclipses the sun, turning it black. Impossible, impossibly, light still emanates from this shadow disk, but it is brown, sickly, and unwholesome. The sun's gentle warmth becomes a hellish furnace 
destroying life as the landscape becomes a bone strewn dust bowl. So, you know, that in and of itself could be the event. And then the heroes just need to figure out uh, how to stop it if it can be stopped or if they can't. Um, or if you don't want them to be able to stop it, then how do they continue to exist in this world that is slowly uh, being destroyed by this, this uh, black sun? Now, the game effects is listed here as well. And there's a, you know, this is a suggested game effect. Uh, you can make up your own if you wanted to. But um, the, uh, the rule book gives, or the core rule book gives this as the following game effect. Food and water grow scarce and temperatures climb to intolerable levels. Creatures are subject to the effects of exposure. And that's for each hour spent unprotected in the tainted sunlight. So obviously being outside during the daytime is bad news. Um, uh, if exposure causes a creature to take a penalty to health, it becomes badly burned and blistered. The dreadful radiation oppre uh, oppresses all that it falls over from the hours of 9 to 11 a.m. and 2 to 4 p.m., Creatures in the Black Sun's light make all d20 rolls with one bane. So that really changes how your characters would be active. Obviously, they would want to not be active during those hours unless they absolutely had to be because they would be making all d20 rolls with, with one bane just for being exposed to the Black Light Sun. Uh, or the Black Sun's light, I should say. Uh, from the hours of 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., they make the rolls of two banes. So it's even worse between 11 and 2. Um, it gets really bad. So, you know, how, how does that change life on the planet? I mean, obviously, it, if it hurts the uh, characters, it would definitely hurt uh, just the average person. Uh, so things would change significantly. It looks like it would be more of a nocturnal world with uh, people being, you know, sleeping during the day to avoid the black sun and then, uh, being more active at night. So that changes uh, how the world works. Um, so you can explore that in your campaign, or you can uh, have your heroes just figure out how to put a stop to it. I actually was in a campaign here recently um, where the Black Sun was one of the shadow effects, and uh, we were, uh, tr you know, we decided we were going to try to put a stop to it. Um, you know, it was destroying the world and uh, it was an unnatural event. So uh, it was our quest to figure out what caused the black sun and uh, what we could do to reverse it. Uh, so that was a uh, that was a pretty fun campaign and uh, we were successful at the end. Yay. But um, but yeah, the world was basically by the end of the campaign, the world was, uh, you know, a very different place than where when it was when we first started. All right, so that is the uh, that's just one example, the Black Sun. So the the others that are included in Shadow of the Demon Lord are Bloom. Uh, Bloom is essentially uh, nature gone wild, nature gone rampant. Um, the let's see, it says the shadow infuses flora with uh, malevolent power, causing plants to shoot up to astonishing size. Forests spring up overnight. Uh, vines swallow cities. Overland travel becomes almost impossible. So you can kind of envision this as, uh, well, you've seen some post-apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic, excuse me to say, um, movies where, um, you know, vines are just growing over everything. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to, to picture uh, the effect that Bloom would have. Uh, of course, you could also say that um, not only vegetation goes crazy, but also animals um, diseases, uh, insects, you know, all forms of life just, uh, become infused with the shadow and just start, um, multiplying, uh, rapidly to the point where humanity can't, or, you know, uh, not just humanity, but, uh, humanoids can't coexist with nature anymore. Nature is actually attacking uh, humanoids and um, nature becomes the enemy. So that would be Bloom. Uh, the next one is Corrupted Organization. Now this was a little less of a apocalyptic event and more of kind of a uh, side effect maybe of uh, the shadow. 
Uh, maybe it's a minor shadow event. I would actually use a corrupted organization as kind of a secondary shadow effect. And that's one thing that you can do with this is you can have a primary shadow effect. Say the black sun is the is the big, big event that's happening. Uh, but then you can have a secondary event. So the corrupted organization. Okay, so now that uh, civilization is a nocturnal uh, because daytime is deadly. Um, you have corrupted organizations such as uh, the Inquisition or the Black Hand uh, that is, uh, you know, taking control of things, and um, uh, you know, uh, thieves are uh, are running the streets, and um, you know, gov governments are actually being taken over by these. Uh, by these uh, corrupted organizations. So anyway, um, that's how I would use corrupted organization. It's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around how a corrupted organization could lead to the end of the world. Uh, it could happen, I suppose. Maybe you have a church that becomes corrupted and that church, um, you know, tries to uh, open up a, a portal to the void um, to, to get the demon lord to come in and uh, just kind of uh, wipe the slate clean, so to speak. But uh, anyway, uh, that is corrupt organization. So the next one is Curse of the Beastmen. Uh, and in that one, basically um, one in ten, one person in ten transforms into a beast man. So all of a sudden, you know, you got ten people in a room. One of them turns into a beast man for no reason. They just, uh, you know, they were normal. Now they are a goat person or they are a wolf person or, you know, a bull person or whatever. Uh, whatever beast man you want to come up with, you know, badger person, you know, sloth person, whatever. Um, and as such, they start, uh, you know, venerating the demon lord because that's the nature of the beast man as they are minions of the demon lord. So they they cease to be your next door neighbor or your daughter, your your daughter's boyfriend or your uh, your wife. And uh, now they are a minion of the demon lord, which uh, kind of makes, you know, things awkward. Um, 10% uh, of the uh, population becomes a uh, beast man. So now you have armies of beast men marching on uh, civilization. Um, not a good thing to have happen. So that is Curse of the Beast Men. Now the next one is Demonic Incursion. This is a classic. Uh, you know what? DM has not wanted to run a Demonic Incursion. All of a sudden... You know, portals start opening up all over the place and demons are just like pouring into the world. And you just got demons everywhere, people being possessed, you know, dogs and cats living together. Um, it's just, uh, it, it's just a you know, classic end of world scenario. Uh, so demonic incursion, can't go wrong with that one. Then you have the Dragon Awakens. I really like this one and I really want to uh, try this out sometime. Um, basically, there is a uh, there's a creature called the Great Dragon, which is a legendary uh, dragon that is just bigger, the biggest, baddest dragon that ever was. You know, size you know, essentially the size of a mountain. And uh, this creature is has been um, you know it's, it's 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 legendary. Nobody nobody knows for sure if it even exists, but one day it awakens, tears itself out from whatever mountain it was sleeping under. And uh, just starts tearing shit up. So uh, the dragon awakens. Uh, there's lots of possibilities with that one. You know, with the dragon, with the great dragon awakening, awakening, uh, all of a sudden, all minor dragons or all other dragons in the world, be, you know, rally to its call. And uh, now all of a sudden, you have a um, a situation like, um, oh, what was that movie with? Uh, uh, with with the dragons that uh, took over the world, can't remember. Yeah, early two thousands had Christian Bale in it. Uh, look it up, Google it. Uh, it was a good movie, and um, that's pretty much what the scenario is. Except the uh, the great dragon is not something that um, Matthew McConaughey is going to be able to take down uh, with an axe by jumping off a building. So um, anyway, Dragon Awakens, excellent, uh, especially if you want to focus on dragons and who doesn't like dragons. Uh, Dreams of the Dead God. Now this one's kind of interesting because what you have here is uh, kind of a, um, an, a scenario where you have a dead god uh, that suddenly becomes psychically active and his 
he, uh, he or she or it begins influencing the world through its dreams and, um, you know, causing nightmares and insanity. And uh, let's see what the game effect is for um, dreams of the dead god. The game effect, the uh, dead god rests somewhere between are uh, somewhere deep in the earth, dreaming in its lightless catacombs. The shadow, ampl- uh, shadow amplifies those dreams and causes weird phenomenon to occur all over the world. Great chunks of the earth tear free from the ground and float into the sky. Water droplets rise from the lakes. Okay, so basically it looks like, um, you know, the laws of physics just kind of go wonky uh, because the uh, dead god's dreams are... Um, you know, basically uh, spreading out to encompass the world and its dream reality becomes our reality or the world's reality. So I guess that's what, uh, that's what that one is. And that would be interesting. I'd have to think about how to really incorporate that into a, a campaign. Uh, but it sounds like it could be a fun one. All right. The fall of civilization. Now fall of civilization is kind of the default um, shadow that the campaign uh, the campaign world is currently in. So the the, uh, the core rulebook uh, details the world of Earth, U-R-T-H, and the uh, the shadow that's fallen over Earth is the fall of civilization with the uh, decline of the empire, uh, the rise of the uh, orc king, uh, Drudge, who, uh, who killed the uh, emperor upon the alabaster throne, thus uh, proclaiming himself as, as a king. And uh, or as an emperor and the, um, you know, the various sections of the empire that's been under its control for eight or nine hundred years. Now, all of a sudden, um, with uh, the emperor dead and this orc uh, usurper on the alabaster throne, all these uh, kingdoms are uh, seceding from the empire. So uh, that is where. The, uh, the 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 default campaign lies, and I kind of used that a little bit when I ran the uh, Tales of the Demon Lord campaign. Um, I basically had the uh, ar- ar- armies of orcs, uh, war bands of orcs, uh, flowing north to the northern reach to try to solidify solidify its grip, uh, the empire's grip on the northern reach. Uh, and presumably the uh, other uh, countries that are, uh, you know, tearing away from the empire. But um, since my campaign was, and that campaign was uh, centered in the nor- Northern Reach, I wanted to bring that up uh, to that part of the empire and, um, you know, kind of have the, uh, the, my campaign, even though it was, really didn't have anything directly to do with the fall of civilization. I brought that in as kind of a secondary, uh, uh, secondary effect. All right. So that's uh, number eight there. Number nine is famine and drought. So, you know, you've got, um, you know, crops failing, you got, uh, uh, months and months without rain, you know, that sort of thing. That's, that's also a classic, uh, world ending scenario. Uh, number 10 is the uh, Herald of the Demon Lord. So this one kind of can go along with the d- demonic incursion. Uh, what you have is a demon prince or a very powerful demon make its way into this world, into your campaign world. And uh, it is the demon Lord's Herald. So it is, it is there basically to usher in uh, the coming of the demon Lord. And so uh, either it's, going to cause the demon lord to come or else the demon lord is already on his way uh you know the 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 barriers between worlds are failing and so the herald is simply the first to come through the first of many to come through ultimately the demon lord himself will come through and that will signal the uh the end of the world so uh what do what do the heroes do do they try to stop the herald do they try to uh strengthen the barriers between the world it's up to you. Um, but again, that's kind of a classic um, demon threat, and uh, you really can't go wrong with that. Uh, infectious madness. So let's see what this one has to say. Uh, let's see. Insanity spreads through, through civilized lands. People experience dreadful hallucinations, frightful dreams, and delusions that lead to suicide, violence, or aberrant behavior. 
And the game effect would be whenever a creature gains one or more insanity, it gains one extra insanity. In addition, each time a creature completes a rest, it gains one insanity unless it gets a success on a will challenge roll. So basically the world's just going crazy. Um, whatever the shadow, uh, with the shadow falling over the world, it's just making sanity very uh, hard to hold on to. And uh, insanity becomes... Um, becomes uh, rampant and so that's infectious madness the next is infestation uh, i think this is uh what is this rodents yeah rodents basically rodents and insects just kind of go crazy kind of along 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 the lines of bloom in fact i would probably mash those two together um just having nature uh in general be the uh, the threat but you could just have infestation uh, as, as a standalone and not have the whole, uh, overgrown, uh, vegetation, you know, uh, crazy man-eating plant, uh, problem, uh, just have it be rats and, and insects or just, or just animals or just insects, you know, um, any infestation of the natural world would, would do in this scenario. Uh, all right. So let's see what's next. Invaders. That's a cool one. You know, you have, um, Invaders from another country, invaders from another dimension, invaders from another world. All those things would be possible and very cool. It would be actually kind of uh, really surreal to have um, your fantasy, you know, your horror fantasy world of Earth all of a sudden under attack by um, Martians. You know, the, you know, the big head um, Martians uh, from the uh, 50s movies. It'd be kind of funny, but at the same time, you know, they have, you know, disintegration um pistols and guns and, and lasers or you could have like a uh war of the worlds type scenario where you have these giant uh metal ships with uh, tentacle legs that are just kind of walking uh, across the world and uh zapping everything that is uh out and about um yeah i could i could definitely see doing a campaign with that a uh, looming star. So a new star appears in the sky, and as it uh, gets bigger and brighter, it causes mutation. So mutation is really the threat here. Um, people start uh, mutating uncontrollably, and so uh, your heroes obviously want to put a stop to that. Pandemic, you know, you got a plague sweeping across the land, disease. Um, how do you put a stop to that? So you have a... Um, a uh, hot zone type scenario here. Uh, let's see what else. Restless Dead. Classic. Undead Rising. You know, zombie apocalypse, vampire apocalypse. Um, any type of undead apocalypse. You got it right here. Ghost apocalypse if you want to. Uh, classic. Uh, very easy to come up with a, uh, with a campaign from start to finish that is nothing but undead. Um, all right, unruly earth. So this is the actual earth that is um, pretty much just rebelling. And that's with earthquakes and with wild weather and tidal waves and tsunamis and, and uh, unnatural storms, that sort of thing. Uh, okay, weird magic. So, you know, this world is infused with magic. Magic is its physics. And all of a sudden it goes wonky. So uh, whenever magical effects occur, things don't go quite as they should. So you got a weird magic table here that you can roll on every time a magical effect is to, uh, is to take place. And uh, you could really kind of expand on that. So, you know, magic is no longer um, a known quantity. You know, the uh, wizards colleges thought that they knew how spells work. Turns out they work differently now. Um so that would be a, uh, an interesting campaign. Uh, the Wild Hunt, this is kind of a fairy apocalypse. So you got, uh, you got the, um, the fairy, uh, the fae, um, the fae queens and princes and kings and queens um, deciding that, uh, you know, they, they don't really want to hang out in the hidden kingdoms anymore. They're going to... Uh, come back into the real world and uh, basically do away with, you know, all of the, uh, the, the humans that have been infesting uh, the place for way too long. Uh, so you have a fairy apocalypse there, and then you have a winter apocalypse. 
and that is you know a new ice age begins so you know you got glaciers forming all over the place uncontrolled snowstorms blizzards dropping temperatures and the like so that pretty much rounds out all of the uh all the shadows of the demon lord now again all of these things are just a means to an end so this is the way that you tell your your end of world scenario and it, it and these are just suggestions now if you want to come up with your own uh, as i said earlier you certainly are able to do so i ran a uh, D and D campaign last year, the year before last, and it was based off of the um, uh, Age of Worms campaign or the uh, adventure path that was in Dragon Magazine way back when, and uh, the that was an end of world scenario, and basically that was based off of the uh, the whole um, Sons of Caius or Spawn of Caius monster which are zombies that are infested with these green worms. And, um, you know, they were created by a, a uh, an ancient um, lich or, you know, uh, ancient wizard named uh, Caius. And so this whole campaign was essentially this uh, age of worms being ushered in. Um, and, you know, these, uh, these, these zombies, worm infested zombies uh, cropping up all over the place. That would have been a perfect, um, campaign to run under the shadow of the demon lord rules um and i still may do that someday because that would fit perfectly into uh into this game um and you know there they're really just tons of different things that you could do uh for the shadow uh that, that causes the apocalypse you know you could even have a uh, robot apocalypse if you wanted to but um it's it's really what what your um, what floats your boat what what kind of story do you want to tell what kind of apocalypse do you want to tell and um you know do you want it to be the end of your world or do you want your players to have a uh, a chance of saving the world and that's really what you kind of have to decide when you're starting the whole campaign and deciding on which shadow you want to pick is this something that they can fix or is this going to permanently permanently alter the world that their characters live in or permanently end the world that they live in. Uh, so some thought has to go into it up front uh, by you to make sure that you, you know what direction uh, that uh, that story is going to go. All right. Hunger in the void. Like I said, just kind of takes the ones that I have uh, just gone through here and expands on them. And I'm not going to go through that like I just did because um I think you got the gist of it, but I do want to kind of um, highlight, excuse me, what's in this book, because uh, it's one of my favorites that's been released. And it's got uh, what, five chapters, and chapter one basically talks about all the shadows that we just talked about. And it uh, it really expands on them. Like, for example, The Dragon Awakens, it talks about how it doesn't have to be a dragon. It can be any type of ginormous monster. It could be a kaiju. It could be Godzilla. Uh, or if you like the Tarrasque from Dungeons and Dragons, it could be the Tarrasque. Uh, or it could be, uh, you know, a giant monster that you uh, invent yourself. It could be, um, you could redo the whole Pacific Rim scenario um, with, uh, you know, giant monsters coming out of the sea. And you have to create giant clockworks to, to battle them. I mean, this is... Um, you know, your, your imagination is the only thing stopping you from making uh, this whatever you want it to be. So, um, you know, that's that's just one example. The rest of them also have different uh, suggestions on how you can expand on the ideas that were first presented in the core rulebook. Uh, so that's a great read. The second chapter talks about the servants of the Demon Lord. So it's got different uh, uh, different cults and organizations, and it's got... Um, demonic magic, um, what it means to fight for the demon lord, just all kinds of uh, cool ideas for organizations that uh, are actually trying to help the demon lord destroy the world. And uh, then you have chapter three, which is a uh, kind of a bestiary, bestiary of uh, creatures that serve the demon lord. So you got uh, mostly, it looks like they're all beastmen, 
uh, expanded fomors, wargs, bugbears, minotaurs, and void bull. Uh, it takes the um, the monsters that are that are in the uh, the core rule book and just adds more options to them. Uh, chapter four is demons. Talks all about demons. It's an excellent chapter to customizing uh, your own demons, um, and also how to you know summon them, bind them, and um, like I said, create them. It talks about demon possession. It's just an excellent read. Um, chapter five is uh, Secrets of the Void, and this really gives you a lot of background on the Demon Lord, creation of the universe, and uh, how things came to be, and why the Demon Lord wants to destroy everything. Um, this kind of get, this kind of has a big secret reveal, um, telling you what the Demon Lord is, the nature, the true nature of the Demon Lord, which kind of when I read it, I was like, wow. Really? That's that's interesting. <laughs> Wouldn't have guessed that. Um, I'm not going to say it here because I don't want to spoil it, but uh, it's 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 pretty cool. It also has incarnations, which is also a uh, an alternative character uh, that uh, could be played. Um, so anyway, uh, excellent excellent supplement. Um, I can't recommend it more. And uh, I would say of, of, of all the supplements that are out there for you to pick up, I would say, you know, you would want to pick up maybe, um, um, well, obviously you want to pick up the core rule book and um, you would want to pick up the, um, uh, what are they called? The, let's see, I got to get all my supplements out here. Uh, you'd probably want the Demon Lord's Companion, at least Demon Lord Companion 1. Um, and uh, Demon Lord's Companion 2 just came out, uh, which is also pretty good. But uh, Demon Lord Companion uh, 1 is a is a must-have. So you'd probably want the core rule book, Demon Lord Companion 1. And then if you're thinking about uh, what other supplement do I want next, I would highly recommend Hunger in the Void. Because uh, even if you don't need ideas on a, an apocalypse scenario. Uh, it's just a fun read. It's just an excellent read. And uh, it really just gives you all kinds of ideas. So uh, I would I would say that would be my uh, my third choice um, in, in order of uh, getting uh, the, the Demon Lord stuff. All right. So that I think uh, is pretty much where I want to end tonight's uh, discussion. So as always, I want to thank you for uh, watching, and uh, next time, yeah, next time, I don't know what we'll do. Maybe we will, uh, Maybe I keep saying we, maybe I will talk more about some supplements, some of the other supplements. Um, maybe I will talk more about the game mechanics. Maybe I'll talk about uh, the world and maybe some of the regions of the world and what's going on there. Or maybe I'll talk religion. I don't know. That's the thing. There's so much to talk about. This game is just full of stuff. Awesome stuff. And, you know, this this, uh, this discussion could go on forever. But, unfortunately, my voice is starting to give out. And um, I think I'm going to call it a night. So, again, thanks for watching. And, as always, i gotta got to give you a hail. Because, you know, that's the formal greeting for uh, all of us cultists. And uh, so there you go. Hail.